everybody. Welcome to the Free at Last podcast. I'm Mick. And I'm Tammy. And we're coming to you live from the Appalachian Mountains right here in the home of Eastern Kentucky, the beautiful Daniel Boone National Forest. And we're excited about tonight. Um, we hope we have some more people come into the group. Uh, we definitely invited some, so we, we uh, hope they come along. But if not, we're going to jump right in to the topic at hand. Tonight we're going to talk about the spirit of Jezebel. Jezebel. <laughs> <clears throat> oh, Jezebel. Oh, Jezebel. I'll play around here for a second. But uh, <clears throat> usually when you when you hear the word Jezebel in the charismatic churches, you will hear something like... They portray it as scary and... and, and <laughs> or... Uh, or some will... Uh, will portray it as like, oh, it's just women that wear too much makeup and, and all that kind of stuff. And uh, But we're actually going to uh, describe what the Bible talks about when it comes to Jezebel and how we as Christians need to guard against what some churches refer to as the Jezebel spirit. Um, I'll give some of my thoughts from uh, our experiences with it uh, a little later on, but uh Sister Tammy, if you, you want to share some there from what you have. Yes, we I uh, have researched, as Mickey uh, calls it. I'm one of the executive producers. <laughs> That's right. But um, <clears throat> when we talk about Jezebel, um, her story is mainly found in First Kings in the Old Testament of the Bible. And I will give references so that you can go back and uh, read the full story. But I just wanted to give you like a gist of what um, the motive of Jezebel was in the Bible. She was obviously against God as we know Yahweh as the Hebrew God. And what she did was she wanted to interfere with worship. She wanted to make sure that the Hebrew God, Yahweh, was not going to be um, introduced or carried forth with the people. And um, so what this did was it provoked a lot of strife, and especially against the prophets of God. And um, we know that she's married to King Ahab, so she is sometimes referred to as Queen Jezebel. But um, what she did was she persuaded King Ahab to introduce the worship of the Tyrian Baal god, which was more of a nature god, was not the living god as what we know, but more of a nature god. And she was, she was fierce with her energy. She probably pushed around her weight. She was probably like, I'm the queen and you're going to do as I say. But uh, she tried to destroy those that were opposed to her. And so we read about in 1 Kings chapter 17 where she gets really upset with Elijah because he is the prophet of God. And, you know, he's wanting to get out worship to the God Almighty, to the Hebrew God. But he prophesies after she had stirred up this trouble with their God Baal. Elijah prophesied that there would be a drought and that there would be divine retribution. So he prophesied that the God Almighty, Yahweh, was going to be getting the divine retribution. And so um, sometime later, Elijah had the Baal priest slain after they had lost a contest with him to see which God would heed prayers to ignite the bull offering. So when Jezebel heard of this slaughter, she was anger, angered, like she was upset to the max. Or like today, we would say, she was a woman scorned. She was a woman scorned, and she swore that she was going to have Elijah put to death, forcing him to flee for his life in First Kings chapter 18. 
But the last thing that Jezebel is attributed, attributed to doing is in 1 Kings 21. And right beside Ahab's palace was a vineyard. And that vineyard belonged to just a commoner. And his name was Naboth. Naboth of Jezreel. And when he refused to part with his vineyard, Jezebel falsely accused him and was blaspheming him, which led to his death by stoning. So Elijah confronted Ahab in the vineyard, and he told him, and he prophesied to him, he predicted to him that he and all of his heirs would be destroyed, and that the dogs in Jezreel would devour Jezebel. So a few years later, Ahab was uh, in battle with the Syrians and perished. And Jezebel lived for about 10 years after King Ahab was killed. And so Elijah's successor was Elisha the prophet. And so Elisha was determined, just like Elijah was, to take down this Queen Jezebel. And so he knew that there needed to be an end that be put to the Baal worship. And so he was what he had, um, like men under him, so to speak. And one of his main people under him was Jehu. And he was anointed to be king of Israel. And so because Jezebel heard of all this, she provoked a civil war. And so her son, Jehoram, was in, in, in King Ahab's position after he had passed. And so um, Jehu, he killed her son at the site of this um, neighbor's vineyard property. And so she went on up to her palace. She's like, oh, you know, she was just, you could, you know, she was just fuming. So she was like, I'm going to get that boy, Jehu. <laughs> and this has always been one of my favorite scriptures. But, you know, she knew that Jehu was going to be looking for her. So in a, in like the modern sense, when you hear the word Jezebel, you think, oh, she's painted up. She's got jewelry on and she's, her hair's all did up, you know, and everything. <laughs> And so she knew that Jehu would be coming to look for her. So she gets in front of her window and has made herself up. And I can just hear her taunting him. Jehu! Oh, Jehu! And so she was calling for him. But what she didn't know was Jehu had ordered her eunuchs to throw her out the window. And so... Uh, Jehu ordered her, after they found her body, to be buried a king's, uh, she was honored kind of in a king's um, way of remembering someone, but it was later discovered that, as uh, history tells it, that they discovered that the dogs had eaten most of her body. So, um, one version we uh, read, or a Bible uh, commentary we looked into said that they ate everything but her hands. And the legend behind that was that the works of her hands were so du so dirty that the dogs didn't even want to partake of the works of her hands. And uh, so you wonder, like, where do churches get the term the Jezebel spirit? Well, like when we study the life of Jezebel, there, there's different commonalities that um, even though she was like in the Old Testament, there's different commonalities that our flesh as a Christian will try to identify with. And we have to keep our flesh under subjection. So as, as we study the life of Jezebel, there are certain things that we have to guard against as well. Because, you know, you know as well as I do that our, our fleshly part of our, of our nature doesn't want to line up with the Spirit of God and what it wants what it wants. And that's where we can easily be led astray by the Jezebelic spirit. 
one of the first things that uh, stands out to me, and this is some of the things that we had to deal with, like personally, uh, somebody that's operating in a Jezebelic spirit, they will always, always, always want to be in control. Um, they, um, they will do whatever they want to do. They want to do the way they want to do it. And they hardly ever will submit under authority. And you can see that in the real Jezebel's life. It's like she was the queen, but she, even in her position, she made the king weak. Mm-hmm. Because well, she did more of the position work than the king did. You can go ahead. And one of the things, like when, you, when I first started out with this, was um, she didn't want the people that she was in control of to worship God. Yeah. And we know in in today's church setting that worship is, it sets us free. Um, it says that God inhabits the praises of his people Israel. So when something tries to steal our worship, it tries to defeat us because, we, you know, it's like that spirit knows that when we worship God, He hears us. That's right. And, you know, it's our release. It's our communion with Him is to pray and to worship. And if she can steal that, she knows that pulls you away, or that spirit. I say she, but it can operate both in male and female. And the other thing I thought was very interesting, and I don't mean this to sound political in any way because I... I really don't like to delve into politics too much because that's I could go on and on and on. <laughs> and, but when that one part you were talking about, where uh, where they reverence nature a lot, and that reminded me a lot of how people get out of balance with the climate change agenda, and it's almost like like people can be so serious about the planet, it's like. In some instances, I think that can steal away from our focus and worship toward God that we try to preserve the planet so much that we we can get the creation in our fore, foremost thought more than the creator. And uh, I thought that was interesting. Another thing that somebody in the Jezebelic spirit um, will always try to do is it hates male leadership. And uh, you notice in the story that Jezebel had all kinds of, um, she had all kinds of spiritual eunuchs around her. And what that symbolizes is, is if you hang around a Jezebel, it's, they're not going to help you grow spiritually, whether they're male or female. And that's another thing I want to mention. A lot of people think, that you have to be a female to operate in the Jezebelic spirit. You don't. Because it, when it comes to spiritual matters, there is no male or female in spiritual matters. It's, a male can be... Um, <laughs> here's one of our hillbilly terms. A male can be ed up <laughs> with the Jezebelic spirit just as much as a woman can. Yeah. And... Um, yeah... <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we uh, know people in our area that instead of being ate up with something, it's ate up. up. <laughs> but, you know, you're talking about the eunuchs and the people that she had around her. I'm sure were her servants that would do anything in the world for her. But what a Jezebel does is they stifle those um, around her that they don't reach their full potential. Yeah. Like, she may recognize, well, I want to say it. It may recognize that you have a gifting and a calling and a talent from God, but if jealousy comes in, they will try to stop you from advancing forward in your calling. And they can also use your gifting and calling against you, especially if, if they're the one in leadership. They always try to put obstacles in front of you, and and they keep you striving to reach those obstacles. Because, like, in your mind, it's like you want to reach a promotion. You want to serve well. uh, You want to do all you can do for the kingdom. But what a Jezebel does is, like, every time that you think that, that you do something 
that's going to get you know promoted in in leadership they move the goalpost a little bit further so you're always striving you're always striving to to hit the mark but but it's impossible because they will never allow you to reach that point to where you actually get the reward and um, the thought comes to mind that we've heard from a minister that uh, we've listened to and followed to, followed along with for a while is Ron Carpenter. And he gave the analogy that when a Jezebel spirit is working in a church, it's like you have a boiling pot. And in a cooking sense, you want to turn the heat down and you want to put a lid on it and you just want to simmer it. <laughs> yeah. and let it cook and symbolically that's what the Jezebel spirit will try to do she will try to keep you contained and you, you're you not being fulfilled and so what happens is um, when you're in a cooking sense when you go down to simmer it's like you're cooking and cooking and cooking and cooking and so what happens is you get overworked yeah so you're all the time striving to to be the best you can be and to go higher, but she keeps putting that lid on and keeps keeps you simmering because uh, that spirit doesn't want you to excel. That's also a way of like keeping you in the dark. <laughs> oh, that's good. Yeah, because if things are covered and the lids put on them, then they think people don't know exactly what's going on in the situation. And it's a very good analogy. <laughs> so, like, that's pretty much the Old Testament version of uh, the Jezebel spirit. And um, so somebody might out there might be saying, what about the New Testament? Does the New Testament mention the Jezebel spirit? And there's different storylines that you can read like in the book of Acts that that could involve the Jezebel spirit but in the book of Revelations I believe it's chapter 2 um, it talks about one of the churches and it talks about uh, one of the things that Jesus said that it had against his church it says for you have allowed that prophetess Jezebel to um, teach things that that she shouldn't and well, he, he actually says you have tolerated that woman Jezebel to uh, lead the people astray, and, and I'm just paraphrasing. So, uh, um, so this Jezebel spirit, it is a real thing because if it wasn't, it wouldn't have been addressed in the last day churches. Um, the one thing that I see a Jezebelic spirit operating in today's church is definitely control. Um, you know, we can rise up against other believers, especially if there's like a spirit of competition in, in the church. Uh, people trying to get titles that they're not really called to, but they want that title for notoriety. Or they're not ready for. Or they're not ready for. Yeah, that, that's a major one. Um, Another one could, can simply be, and I, I think a lot of this came from the prosperity gospel movement. Um, I call this the seduction of ministry. I believe that um, the prosperity gospel movement has pushed the, the blessings of the Lord out there so much that it put our focus on, on God's blessing and it took it off, off the benefactor. And I believe that what what in the church has happened is like the prosperity gospel is, has elevated a mindset in the church that thinks that if you don't have such and such and such and such that you're not blessed or you're not walking out in the calling that God has given you. Um, you know, I believe in prosperity, but... When you're in when you're in ministry and your main focus is your prosperity, there's something wrong, because as soon as Jesus leaves the your as soon as he leaves the forefront of your vision, then you're off track, because your whole focus should be what you can do to glorify him and what you can do 
to bring people to him. Um, if your mission is anything off of that, then you're not doing the gospel right. And I don't mean that to sound harsh or anything. And this is this is things that, I, that we've had to learn the hard way. And I'll say me more, more or less on this one more than Tammy because, you know, I, at one time I bought into all that because I wanted to be blessed. I wanted to be blessed to bless other people. But I found myself in a place where it brought me to where I had to repent because like in the book of Revelations, that one church says, uh, repent for you've lost your first love. And all that to say this, like, if you really want to be a blessing to the kingdom of God and God's calling, you know, as far as prosperity goes, whatever you need to complete your mission in God, God will provide that. And if you result in Jezebelic tactics of taking out whoever you can take out or, or mow over whoever gets in your way, you're not going to prosper in anything. And even if you do, it's not the Lord prospering you. It'd be the enemy prospering you. And I've, I've said this a thousand times, whatever the arm of the flesh has to build up, that same arm of the flesh will have to provide for it. And if God's not, pro if he's not the provider of the provision that you're after, then you'll always be seeking and so with the spirit of Jezebel, one thing that I wanted to add in um, as far as what we have been delivered from in the occultic church, the Jezebel spirit always, um, it uses words of flattery. Yeah. And um, what we saw through our experience, it happened to be a female, and you could definitely tell the spirit of Jezebel was working but she had all the men under her thumbs, so to speak. Like she was flattery with them. She would um, exalt them in front of the church. She would rub on them. Like, you know, when I say rub on, I don't mean like groping, but like rub on their shoulder or their arm, make that physical contact. It would be like fake affection. And, um, you know, men are... Um, driven by touch. I mean, that's just the way they are, and women are more emotional. Um, but it knows how to get to your weakest point to make you feel special, to make you feel needed and wanted. And you have, as a Christian, it what it develops in inside of you is that need to always please. Yeah. She wants, you know, all the attention. Um, you feel like that everything you do, you got to keep that person that's um, under the spirit. You have to keep them liking you. So you do little things for them. You give them gifts. You, you know, do this thing. And the spouse generally, from what we have seen, is by the wayside. <laughs> you yeah. know, they don't get much um fellowship they don't get much um hugs and love you know and if you notice people that operate under this the spirit they uh and i've also seen this with a male that's been under the spirit is they want to get the men of the house and keep in mind it was ahab who was her husband that she manipulated. Yeah. And so it's a it's almost like the spirit attacks the, the man in his priesthood role in the home. Yeah. And so what it, uh, it tries to do is to um, um, kind of have power and alienate them from their families. Uh -huh. And we have seen that as well, um, where that spirit has tried to put in the forefront church comes before family and it's like no it doesn't <laughs> you know we, we've even we've even been in the church where they say the church even comes before god and it's like how can you be that naive even in the church to say that your church comes before god <laughs> so if you're listening and you know maybe you have identified some of these things that we've talked about here today it's like you know we pray that the Holy Spirit will give you discernment 
on how to deal with that, how to confront that spirit, and to regain your family if you've lost it based on the Jezebel spirit. That's right. And if you'd like to uh, share your story with us, we'd love to hear from you. You can email us at uh, freeatlastpodcast at yahoo.com or um, you can reach out to us at uh, freeatlastministries.org. Uh, we would love to hear your story and uh, maybe possibly share it on a future podcast. But uh, we are going to go ahead and uh, wrap things up uh, here kind of quickly. Uh, we want to uh, throw this out there, too. If you'd like to be a supporter of this ministry, we have uh, two tiers here on uh, on the Podbean Patron program. Um, the first tier is $3 a month. With that, you will get access to our Facebook group, which we will do uh, maybe a show or two in there. It's like a community. Yeah, we have a community of awesome people that even if you uh, don't get to talk to us, we have uh, some awesome people in there. It's an awesome group of like-minded uh, Christians in there. So that tier is like $3 a month, and for $5 a month, we're going to do like extra teachings on here about um, things that help you grow in your Christian faith. We're going to have uh, dream interpretations and just just some other things we can think of to help you grow in your, in your walk with the Lord. Absolutely, and we appreciate your support. We uh, thank you for your encouragement. And um, we want to give a shout out to Sister Sue Lawson. Yeah, Sister Lou, Sue, Sister Lou, <laughs> Sister Lou, Sister Sue, and Brother Josh. And I can't see the other. I can't one. see. Um, it looks like. Um. And we want to give a shout out to Azria Vxm. Uh, yeah. I hope I said that right. And. Benjamin Pettison, thank you for joining in tonight. This is actually our second attempt, so we we hope to get better as we go. <laughs> yeah, but we appreciate you all, and we uh, just are thankful for what the Lord is doing, and we will pray for you this week, and we'll be on here again next week on Tuesday is our regular podcasting time but um, between now and then we pray that you're blessed and you have a wonderful week see you guys <laughs>